if you can turn with me in the Bibles, if you have one. <coughs> or one, that's fine, I will read that aloud so you can read it. 2 Samuel and chapter 4. I'll just read one verse, and then we'll go to 2 Samuel and chapter 9. 2 Samuel and chapter 4. And in his service, he achieved mighty deeds by the help of God. 
and the men and the women began to sing songs and songs about this young warrior by the name of David, to the point where King Saul became jealous. Because this young warrior, David, who was under his command, serving in his army, was getting more recognition and more praise than he was as the king of Israel. But Saul also had a son, his name was Jonathan. He had more than one son, a number of sons. One of them, his name was Jonathan. And David and Jonathan became very good friends. They had a tremendous bond, like brothers. Their souls were knit together. And Saul himself, personally as king, a number of occasions, he tried to kill David. And after some time, he sent some of his soldiers to pursue David. While he was king. But despite all of this, Jonathan and David, their friendship was thick. Their friendship was intimate. And they were close, just like brothers. And during that time, whilst David was trying to escape from King Saul and his soldiers, they had more than one occasion, they made vows to each other. And David promised Jonathan. And Jonathan said to David, Now you vow to me, you make a promise to me, that irrespective of what happens in the future, that you will protect and you will guard and you will look after my family and my descendants and my offspring. And David vowed this. And David promised this. And there came a time in the history of Israel where they went to battle with the Philistines and as a result, and during that battle, both Saul and his son Jonathan were killed. They were both killed. And as news trickled back to the city, to the town, a servant who was looking after the son of Jonathan, whose name was Mephibosheth, can you imagine being on the sporting team of Mephibosheth? Calling out to Mephibosheth every 10 seconds is not a good job. It's not a common name, it's not an easy name to say, but his name was Mephibosheth. He was five years old when his dad died, his dad Jonathan. That's what we're told. And his grandfather saw him. And as it was the custom of the day, the servant girl who was looking after young Mephibosheth realised that he, a descendant of Jonathan and King Saul, was in danger. And she took him up and she fled. And in her fleeing, whether she dropped him or he fell on his own court, he fell. And as a result of his falling, he became lame and crippled. And off he went to a distant land by the name of Lodibar, and we're told in our reading that he lived there up to this very point that we read about. Now in that period of him fleeing and where we read about King David, Israel was divided for a period. When King Saul died, one of his sons, Ishbosheth, by Abner, was made king of the eleven tribes. Not of Judah, David became king of Judah. And they had, for a period of time, a civil war. And Ishbosheth died, and the civil war ceased, and David became king of the entire united tribes of Israel. And for a period of time, from when David became king to where we started reading, was probably 15 to 20 years of civil war, and once Israel was united once more, they had to fight and battle those nations surrounding them. And for a short period of time, and probably for the first time in the nation of David's reign as king of Israel, there was relative peace. Relative peace. And that's where we start our reading. And David said, David asked among those servants of his, is there any left in the household of Saul, that I may show kindness. The word kindness there, you mentioned, you notice it's mentioned three times. Verse 1, verse 3, and verse 7. And when the word used, the original word there is hesed in the Hebrew. It doesn't just mean you cannot be nice to somebody, it's more than that. It's a word that in English is usually translated love. 
But our English translation of the word love is very limited. The word there is loving kindness, a steadfast, enduring, reliable, promised, covenant-keeping love. It's a love you can rely and you can rest and you can trust on. It's a love that is undeserving. And David says, is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show this hesed, this love, this loving kindness to? And they find a servant who used to serve under the king of Saul, King Saul, and he remembers one who is still alive. Now what do you have to remember? In the ancient East, and the culture and the custom of the time was this, if a new king, a new king came to power, what he would do in order to establish his throne and to safeguard any future claim or threat to his throne, they would track down and they would gather together all of the family associated with the previous king and they would kill them. Now to us that sounds brutal, but that's what was done. Here is King David. He's come through what was civil war within the nation of Israel. He's come through fighting the battles of those nations once Israel was united that was surrounding them. And he comes to a point in his life as king where there's relative peace and he sits down and he asks the question, is there anybody left in the house of King Israel? Now, many around him must have thought, well, David's just probably wrapping up loose ends in terms of his kingship. To ensure, as a safeguard and a safety net, that there is no threat available, whether it be in the land of Israel or outside of it, that can take a claim to his throne. And he asked the question. But he says, in whom I can show loving kindness. And Ziba says, there's one, his name is Mephibosheth. He is lame in both of his feet, he's unable to walk, he is crippled, and he's living in the house of Nakur, and it is in Lodi. Now, if we know anything about Lodi, Lodi was a town or a city that was barren. It had no pasture, it had no food, it was desolate. So here we have. Instructed by the man by the name of Ziba, that yes, there is one living. His name is Mephibosheth. We're told he's crippled, he cannot walk, he's lame in both of his feet. And he's living in this desolate town, without pasture, without food, in the house of Mekur. What does David do? David says, Now you go and fetch him. You go and fetch him. We know that Mephibosheth was five years old. But the servant took him and fled, and he fell, and became lame and crippled. By the time David's servants come knocking on the door of Makur's house in Lodibar, he's in his early 20s. He's in his early 20s. He's a young man. Now, I try to find out how far Lodibar was from Jerusalem. And you sort of get different answers, but it was roughly in today's language, about 150 to 200 kilometers, the distance. If you've ever been to Ballarat, Ballarat from here is about 140 k's. If you've ever been to Bendigo, Bendigo is just short of 200 k's. So that's roughly the distance of all. They didn't hop in their cars and do 100 k's up the road, the freeway. They had to walk, or on horseback. And David, knowing that Mephibosheth was lame, he must have made provision to bring him back. And so off David's entourage went to Lodabar. This town of nothing. And can you imagine, in the house of Mekur, they hear the knock on the door. And whoever opens the door speaks to a servant of the king King David. And as they talked, they must have looked behind this king, the servant's king, and seen this entourage in the back and thought to themselves, they're coming for him. They would have asked the question, we are looking for a man by the name of Mephibosheth as he lived here. And the response would have been this. Yes. 
Mephibosheth was hiding for all of those years, fleeing from the new king of Israel in a place that was barren under that harsh shell of fruit, and the knock came at the door. It was a servant of the king, and they were looking for him. And off Mephibosheth goes with his entourage of the king. And you can only begin to imagine what would have entered into his mind at the time. The state that it was in. And the king now is calling for him. Knowing what the custom and the culture was of the day. And he hops in the wagon, or he hops in the car, and he's unable to walk, and off he goes. Now if it's 150, 200 k's journey, we're talking about three to four days to get back to King David. Now, I don't know what Mephibosheth was like, but I think things could have gone one of two, two ways. Mephibosheth, sitting in that carriage or that car, every five minutes might have been firing off questions to those servants. Why, why does he want me? What does King David want to do with me? What did he say when, I, when you left? Surely there's something you can tell me. He could have been like that the whole way. You think of it. That entire journey. Or... It could have been just absolute silence. But Mephibosheth thought to himself, well, this is it. He's found me. They've located me. I know what's going to happen. And there's nothing that I can do. Three to four days journey back. And then we're told, Mephibosheth is brought. Whether he was able to stumble along with crutches, whether he was even unable to walk, I don't know. It doesn't say that. And he's brought before King David. And the first we're told when he comes into the presence of the king, how do we find his posture? He is flat on his face before the king. What does David say to him? (laughs) David simply says his name. He says to him, I'm going to finish him. And he acknowledges the king. The first thing David says to him after saying his name, he says to him, Mephibosheth, do not fear. Don't be afraid. Because I will show you kindness. Loving kindness. The loving kindness of God I will display to you for the sake of another. For the sake of Jonathan, your father. I will show you loving kindness. And he goes on to explain what that entails. He says to him, I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. All of his land. But more than that, you, Mephibosheth, you will come into my home. You will sit at my table. You will be like one of my sons. And you will eat bread continually at my table. What was Mephibosheth expecting when they brought him in that wagon and they brought him to the palace of the king and they put him in front of the king? What was he expecting to have? Knowing all of the custom, Mephibosheth was expecting that his life would end that very day. That was what he deserved as a descendant of King Saul. With David now in power. That's what he was expecting. What does David do? David says to him, I will show you kindness for the sake of another. Not because you deserve it. Mephibosheth had never met. Uh, David had never met Mephibosheth. He never knew him. He knew nothing about him. But the loving kindness that he was to display was for the sake and on behalf of another. All of the land of King Saul was restored to him. And King Saul was a wealthy man. Mephibosheth, who was crippled, who was lame, who was living in the house of another in a land with no food and no pasture. He was brought out before the king. And instead of death and his life taken, loving kindness was shown to him for the sake of another. All of the king's land was restored to him immediately. He was invited into the home of King David and he was seated at his very 
table. You know who else was seated at the table? Royalty. Princes. Leaders of David's army. People of renown and of worth and relationship to the king. Sons of the king. They were brought into his home and seated at his table. And here comes Mephibosheth, laying in both his feet. Deserving only of death. The land is restored to him through the kindness shown for the sake of another. Seated at the king's table, and he would eat and he would feast continually in the house and the table of David. More than that, Ziba was instructed by King David to take his sons and his servants, and they would farm and they would work the land and they would harvest it, and all of the food would belong to Ziba and to Mephibosheth. Yet Mephibosheth would sit at the king's table continually. You and I were born into the family of Adam. The family of Adam. The Bible tells us that as by one man, that is Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death has passed upon all men, for all men have sinned. The family of Adam. As a result of being born into the family of Adam, each and every one of us without exception have been born with a nature of sin. And we have continued in our daily practice to exhibit and to manifest in various ways the sinful nature. The Bible is clear. It tells us that as a result of sin is death. The wages and the judgment of sin is death. Mephibosheth, in his lameness, in his crippleness, in his helplessness, is a picture of you and I in the world today in our sinful condition. Living apart from God, not living a life that is pleasing or obedient to God, quite the opposite. In a distant land, in a distant place, far from God, where there is no pasture, there is no life, there's nothing living, it's barren, it's desolate. Lame and crippled as a result of the fall. Unable to do nothing about our situation and our condition. Deserving only of death as a result of sin. God, in His great heart of love towards you and I, as we were reminded this morning, God's heart of love to, towards us if you want to call it, in Lodabar, as sinners crippled by the fall, his heart was moved in love towards us. God doesn't just tell us that he loves us, but he showed it, he demonstrated it. In doing so, he gave and he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived on this very earth, a perfect, sinless life like nobody else. Nobody else has ever lived. He went to the cross, and on the cross he bore and he suffered the full weight and the judgment of sin that was due, of punishment of God, the righteous God, that was due as a result of sin. And there he bore in his body on the cross. The Bible tells us he died. The Bible tells us he was buried. But the Bible tells us that on the third day God raised him from the dead. And today, the invitation goes out to each and every one of us. Each and every one of us, the invitation goes out. God's invitation, the gospel message, the invitation of salvation. And God is able to extend this loving kindness to sinners who are undeserving for the sake of another. For the sake of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. On his behalf, he's able to extend to you and I, just like David was able to do to Mephibosheth on behalf of his covenant promise with his father, John. God is able to extend to you and I in our sin this loving kindness. On behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did, You know, when Mephibosheth stood before the king, 
and he prostrated himself before the king. When David spoke to him afterwards, he said, how is it that you can show such kindness to a dead dog such as I? A dead dog such as I. In order for us to come into the room blessing and to be seated around the king's table and to become as one of his sons and to eat bread continually, we need to understand and we need to acknowledge our condition before God. There needs to be a repentance on our behalf of our condition and our sin. You see, Mephibosheth understood his condition as he came before David. He knew what he, what he deserved. But as a result of grace, as a result of mercy, as a result of love, what he deserved was withheld from him. What he didn't deserve was given freely to him. Just as God offers salvation to us today, we are deserving as sinners only of death. But if we, like the Shephibosheth, confess our sin, understand our condition before we stand before a righteous and a holy God, God will withhold the judgment that was due to us because He placed it on the Savior at Calvary. And God will pour out the blessings, the spiritual blessings that we are entitled to as a result of our repentance and a result of our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, our faith and our trust in Him. God will extend to us just as David poured out blessing and loving kindness upon the fruition. So too will you be the recipient of God's blessing. Sins forgiven, eternal life, reconciliation, justification, assured a place for eternity at the table of God Himself, seated with the Son. Adopted into his family, eating continually at his table. Friend, let me say to you this morning God, who is a God who wants and who is and who is able to extend to you this morning, if you are still in your sin and you haven't put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, He is able to extend to you His loving kindness, a reliable, a steadfast, an enduring love, a love that is undeserving, just like David did to Mephibosheth. And all that is required of you to do, as Mephibosheth lay on his face, prostrate before the king, he confessed his condition. He was worthless. He was undeserving. Confess your sin. Acknowledge your sin. Repent your absolute helplessness to do anything before God in the matter of your sin. And God will extend to you in your faith and in your trust and your obedience and your belief. For the sake of another, God will extend to you His loving, reliable, enduring, <coughs> steadfast love, sins forgiven, and assured a home in heaven and a place seated at His table. I trust that you this morning will be obedient you this morning will exercise faith and trust in the Saviour who died for you on the cross of Calvary, and we give thanks in our Saviour's name.